Hey, what's up you guys? It's Kasha. So today's video is gonna be a little bit different. It's not gonna be another unboxing video. But today I'm gonna be answering a question that I think you might have and you know, a lot of people in my life have asked me a bajillion times, especially if you follow me on Instagram, is, you know, I do a lot of traveling and a lot of people ask me all the time, like, how do you afford to travel all the time like that? Like, how do you do it? And first of all, it's not because I'm rich. It's because when travel is your passion, like it is for me, you kind of find ways to make it happen. And over the years, I've kind of picked up a lot of uh, tips and tricks along the way and I do believe that over time it becomes kind of like an art form and at this point in my life I feel like I have gotten pretty good at like figuring out how to find those deals. I've kind of mastered the art if you will. Well, I haven't mastered. I'm sure there's a lot I still haven't figured out yet, but I did pick up a lot of steps and tips and tricks along the way and I'm gonna to try to fit them all in this video here so you guys can reference this and try to figure it out on your own and uh, hopefully book some travel for yourself because it's like I believe that it's super doable you even if you only have like $50 or $100 you can plan a really cool trip that's super refreshing that will give you the time of your life uh, that will be a lot of fun will be eye-opening you'll learn a new experience and you'll go come back to work on Monday all refreshed I especially thought that this would be a good time right now for me to post this video because we're getting into the very end of summer you know it's the end of August and maybe you're planning a Memorial Day trip or no Memorial Day the beginning of summer Labor Day is the end of summer if you're playing a Labor Day trip, um, but I also think that that last week of August is a really good time to plan a trip because a lot of people are already all burnt out and spent, have spent all their money on travel throughout the summer so they don't have any travel money left for that last week plus they're getting ready for school and getting ready for this or that so there's not a lot of people traveling that last week so you should go traveling that last week because you'll get better deals <laughs> but enough rambling let me just get right into it and show you those tips and tricks also this is going to be a pretty long video so i'll try to leave some timestamps down below so you can skip around in case there's a certain tip or trick that you're looking for. If you watch this and you want to re-watch it for a certain tip, um, there'll be timestamps down below of the different tips so you can skip around. <laughs> so I've kind of organized this into like 10 tips, uh, but it's not going to be a perfect 10 step system. It's going to be a kind of a lot of ra rambling, so uh, bear with me a little bit here. Uh, but I'm going to share you with you as many things as I can think of right now that I do when I book travel that you can use to book your own travel and save a ton of money. So the first and most important tip in my opinion is to be flexible. <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna show you my notes, my messy ass notes. The most important thing you can do to sell yourself a shit ton of money while you're planning traveling is to be flexible. And there's many different ways to be flexible when you're planning travel. If you can be flexible on where you go, how you're gonna get there, when you're gonna go, how long you're gonna go for, what method of transportation you're gonna use, what kind of accommodation you're gonna accept, what you're gonna do when you get there. Like the more of those categories that you can be flexible about, the better deal you're gonna get. And that, this kind of goes into a lot of the other tips I'm gonna talk about, including the next tip, which is do not travel during peak season. Try to figure out what your dream destinations are and research when is peak season for them and when is the shoulder seasons and when is the off season. You're not gonna save very much money if you're traveling during peak season during, during places. For instance, if you're trying to go to Paris in July, <laughs> the most unpleasant part of traveling for me is experiencing like way too many tourists. Up, up there with expensive costs, uh, too many tourists it makes, makes travel a little bit less enjoyable. So an alternative to that is trying to kind of figure out uh, what the shoulder seasons are so you can still enjoy a lot of the same sites uh, get better prices on accommodation and better prices on flights but still enjoy a lot of the same 
lovely weather of that destination that you're looking at and I'll experience a lot of the same attractions. Of course, you're gonna get the best deals on your said destination if you go during the off season, but something to look out for during the off season is that in certain locations, the off season, a lot of things might be closed. So for example, say you wanted to go visit the Grand Canyon in the winter, which would be the off season. You might get there and find out that during certain parts of the year, the north rim of the Grand Canyon is closed. So if you really want to see that north rim, you don't want to go during the off season, but the, the shoulder seasons will still be really cool. But I did go to the Grand Canyon this year during the off season, and you can only see the south rim, but it's still super enjoyable. I do believe the entrance fee to the Grand Canyon is actually cheaper in the winter. It's like $10 cheaper, but it's for the whole week so you can keep coming back. You can spend a whole week at the Grand Canyon if you wanted. I've actually gone to the Grand Canyon twice during the off season. One of the first big trips I ever planned was a cross-country road trip through the bottom of the USA and I went uh, soon after New Year's, right in the beginning of January, which is a really good time to start traveling because um, everybody's broke from Christmas, so nobody has a time of money to spend on traveling, so not a lot of people are traveling, and therefore all these hotels and flights are a lot cheaper um, because they're just trying to get that those rooms filled, those, those planes filled. So you're gonna get some really good deals in the winter. Um, well, anyway, me and my boyfriend traveled across 35 states and almost never saw snow because we traveled along the bottom. And we spent six weeks, maybe seven weeks, eight weeks, traveling across the USA and between gas and hotel rooms only spent about a little over a thousand dollars each. And that's in a month, you know, that's how much I we spend when we're just at home doing nothing. So consider the off season, but do a little research um, and then consider shoulder seasons. And also wherever you are during peak season, consider doing some staycations, you know, some local travel. In the summertime where I live in New England and also in the fall, I try, I try to kind of stick around and I try to plan a lot of local travel because there's so many amazing things right here in my backyard that I can enjoy for just a couple of drives away. So I try to plan a lot of like day trips and short trips just around. Um, for instance, at the beginning of August for my birthday, I spent a week at Hampton Beach and it was so much fun. Oh my gosh, we, you know, the weather was beautiful. We went and saw the Beach Boys. We went on water slides. We played arcade games. We went to the casino. We went to the beach every day, went swimming and saw the fireworks. Like it was just an action packed, super fun week. And uh, I didn't have to take a fl flight there. And next week, I just booked on Airbnb uh, during the last week of August, uh, two nights in New York City for $42 a night. Um, and you know, free parking, I'm gonna drive in, and it's gonna, you know, less than $100 for a little New York getaway. Like, that's actually a great deal because even on my favorite accommodation websites, it's hard to find a good priced room in New York City. <laughs> like a really, really cheap room. Except if you're going during kind of like an unbusy week, for instance, that last week of August, like I mentioned earlier, is a good week to go. Um, because a lot of people are going back to school, they might already be in school, they might be out of money from earlier in the summer, so they're just kind of trying to chill out that last week, and therefore you can take advantage of that, and so, uh, you know, do something cool. So that goes into the third tip, is to book early, but not too early. When it comes to staycations, sometimes if you uh, book like the week before, you can get some of the best deals because those hotel rooms are gonna try to uh, fill up those rooms that they still haven't booked. So that, you know, a couple days before, or like, I think there's a site, I'll try to leave the link down below, it has deals on like last minute trips, a last minute uh, accommodation. Sometimes you can find good deals that way, but, in general, as a rule of thumb, especially if you're going somewhere further away, if you're take booking a flight somewhere or you're planning rent a car or anything like that, book early, but not too early. Um, I recently found out that the best time to book accommodation and flights is ex 
uh, approximately. This is like a study, studies have proven this, have found this average, that if you book 54 days before your trip, on average, you will find the best deals. And also, to go with that, uh, if you book on a, like your, especially when it comes to flights, if you book on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, you're gonna get better deals. And if you try to fly in on a Tuesday or a Wednesday and fly out, um, if you designate those as your travel days, you will get better deals that way too. Lots of talking. So much talking. I'm only on tip number three, oh my god. And I'm already kind of going into the next tip, um, which is how I find cheap flights. So if you fly in and fly out and book on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, the reason those are tend to be some of the best days for deals is that, you know, after the weekend on Monday is when airline companies tend to put out their sales. You know, those sales exist throughout Tuesday and or Wednesday, and they tend to get shut down by Thursday, where people are starting to book their flights for the weekend, their business travel, this and that. So the, re the way I usually start looking for a cheap flight, I've already covered that, you know, I only try to travel during shoulder seasons or, or the off season. I don't even attempt to try to book flights during peak season because you're not going to find very good cheap ones. And also tip number one, be flexible. Well, flexibility helps a lot. Because of my line of work, I already have a kind of pretty flexible schedule where I can plan these kinds of things. Because I've already been a makeup artist for three years now, I already kind of know when my slower seasons are for work, which makes it easier for me to just be like, I'm not going to work that, that month and I want to go travel. And they t tend to be really good off seasons to go traveling to. You know, January, January is an off season for makeup and it's also a, a really good time to go traveling because nobody else is traveling because Everybody's broke from Christmas, but another slow season that I like to travel in is March. I, I'll, I have very little work in March. There's like no real holidays except for St. Patrick's Day. I know that I have like a month of time where I can squeeze in some really good travel. But the first thing you want to do when you begin your search for flights is you want to put your browser into an incognito window. You want to delete your cookies and put your browser into an incognito window. And the reason you want to do this is because much like Facebook, how they track your activity, airlines do the same thing. If an airline sees that you're looking at a certain flight over and over and over, they get the idea that you're interested in that flight and they might hack up that, that price. Uh, putting your browser into the incognito window will make it so they can't track your activity and can't hike up that price. And if you want to check those prices from different computers, that can help too. But yeah, step number two would be uh, once you've opened that incognito window, you want to go into google.com slash flights. That's where I usually begin my search for cheap flights. Google is really fun to use because it gives you a really broad sense of all the different flights that are available to you. For instance, I'll start by putting in my departure airport, which is either usually either Bradley International in Hartford, Boston Logan, or New York. New York, either JFK or LaGuardia. Uh, almost never there, but if I'm doing domestic travel, I'll probably leave out of Hartford because it's closer and easier and smaller and less of a pain in the ass. Um, but if you're doing international travel, you're probably going to get cheaper, better deals if you leave out of an international airport like Boston Logan, which also offers this great new airline that offers really cheap flights to Europe call, called Wow Air. I've flown with them twice. They're very minimalistic, but they offer great deals. And they fly out of, I think, both New York and out of Boston. And Boston tends to have really good deals. So what I will do is I will put that destination airport plus a really broad area of where I might want to go. So I'd go like from Boston Logan to Europe or Boston Logan to Australia. And it will pop up a little map of different prices to different destinations round trip or one way however you want to do it. So say I find a destination that I'm really interested in that has a pretty cheap flight. Um, say you know, Boston to Dublin. Like Dublin sounds really cool. I found a flight for $500, right? So I take, you go and click on that flight in Google Flights 
and they might sometimes Google Flights will offer like a little bit cheaper like say you can save $57 if you leave on Tuesday um, so I'll click on that and then they might do another leg discount if you leave on this day or return on this day and I click on that finally say you found a really cheap flight that you like say you're flying Boston to Dublin and you're leaving on September 17th and you're returning September 26th. But take that same flight information and put it into kayak.com. I'll leave that link down below. And kayak.com has this cool feature that will search all the available f flights three days before and three days after your arrival date and your departure date and will all suggest the cheapest flight overall within your window so it makes like a big grid of all different prices um, so out of that grid you can go ahead and pick the cheapest overall and then you click on that price and then it will tell you that they found this particular deal on some website whether it's Expedia or Priceline or Travelocity you know kayak searches the internet and tries to find the best deal then wherever that deal exists Ex say it is Expedia, um, you go to the Expedia website and try to find that same flight. If, it, if you book directly through Expedia, they will offer it for even cheaper. And then you find that price on, say, Expedia, which I sometimes use because they also offer a point system every time you book with them. Um, but then once you find that deal on Expedia, if it's even cheaper, it will often say on Expedia, what airline that deal will be with. I also will then go to the airline's website <laughs> and see if you can find it even cheaper. I don't usually do this if I, you know, initially sometimes if I, if I like, if the price is good enough for me out of Google Flights, I'll book right out of Google, Google Flights. If I like the price on Kayak, I'll book it out of Kayak. Uh, if I like the flight on um, Expedia, I'll book it right out of Expedia. But I have all gone all the way to the airline's website and found the best deal on the actual airline's website and then booked the deal right there. <laughs> so it's a bit of a process, but, but I've done exactly this before. Like when I found, I used the example earlier of Boston to Dublin, I actually found a ticket there. It was like $500 from Boston to Dublin round trip. I found that flight on Google Flights, so then I put it on Kayak, and Kayak brought it down to $450, and, and then I put in that same flight into Expedia, and then the Expedia didn't offer a cheaper price, but I tried uh, putting it into the airlines website, and the airline saved me, I think, $5, like, so my flight ended up being four, four forty-five, which is really, at the time, the cheapest international deal I, I ever was found, so... That is how I go through booking a flight. And there's lots of other websites that you can use to find really cheap flights. Like say, if you're really flexible about your destination, you can use skyscanner.com. That, that's a good website to find the cheapest de destination flights. Um, but this is the system that I like to use because it's worked for me in the past and uh, I figured it out at this point and I like it. Um, and I've gotten really good deals this way. So. That is how I book a flight. So now that you've booked your flight and you figured out your flight and you got a really good deal, uh, the next tip I can give you is tip number five, which is travel with cabin baggage only. <laughs> One good way to hike up the price of your flight is if you are paying an extra 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 dollars for a, check, a checked bag. If you're trying to travel on a budget and you're trying to travel often and travel well and easily you're gonna be so thankful if you have not a ton of baggage with you um, so not only are you not gonna be paying extra money to check a bag and it doesn't even matter how long you're going for whether you're going for just a couple days or if you're going for a month you should only need to take some checked baggage for instance when I traveled a backpacked across Europe for a month in 2015 I only took one backpack with me one big travels carry-on size backpack I'll actually show you it was 
It was a different one, but it was basically just like this. It, this, this is an Osprey backpack and it's cabin luggage size and it's really cool because it opens like a suitcase um, and it has all these compartments so you can put your dirty clothes up front um, and you know it's nice and deep. It's the size, it's, I think it's, I think this is actually maximum carry-on size. I can't even fit it all in frame. <laughs> but yeah, what you want to do is just pack you know, enough outfits for the week, one or two pairs of shoes, uh, you know, some travel adapters, a camera, maybe a laptop, maybe an iPad, um, just like a few essential things. You know, if you're staying for more than a month, you just do laundry along the way, you find a laundromat, a few small toiletries, don't overdo with toiletries. Um, you, even if you're going for a month, <laughs> probably not gonna use up an entire bottle of shampoo, a big bottle of shampoo. Those are you save yourself so much money if you just and so much like frustration if if you just have cabin luggage you can walk off the plane and not have to wait for your bag to come off the trolley you could just head out of the airport and go start having fun you never have to worry about your luggage getting lost and then you know if you're trying to hurry to catch a flight you only have your one bag with you that you can throw on your back and you can start running you know instead of having two big old bags that you can't actually run with there's just i can't stress enough if you're flying anywhere travel with cabin luggage only you know in europe cabin Bags are a little bit more restrictive. There's certain airlines that make you pay extra for cabin luggage, or they they won't let you take on this size. They will only take you, let you take on like a purse or something. But yeah, just do that research. If you're traveling domestically, almost always you can take a cabin-sized uh, suitcase, and then you can also take a smaller bag, like a smaller backpack with you. And those two things, you can fit a lot of things. And in America, when you travel domestically, nobody ever weighs anything. Um, they might weigh your cabin luggage in Europe sometimes on the, on the budget airlines, but my experience has been, um, you know, you don't have to deal with that at all in, in America. So I think I messed up and I don't actually have 10 tips. I uh, have, because I don't, uh, it doesn't look like there's a tip number six. So let's go ahead and talk about tip number seven, how to find cheap hotels. First off, I almost never like book traditional hotels. Nine out of 10 times, I'm always booking on Airbnb.com. <laughs> I always find the best deals and the cheapest rooms and really enjoyable st stays at Airbnb. Dot com. I'll have a link down below so you can try out Airbnb yourself. I'm such a big Airbnb enthusiast. Um, if you use my link, you can also get, I think, up to $40 off your first day on Airbnb, so totally check it out. Like I say, 90% of the travel I've ever done has been on Airbnb, and I almost never pay more than $50 a night. Um, it's a huge network. You can find rooms basically anywhere on the planet. Well, let me first tell you what Airbnb even is. It's a website for home sharing. So what it is, is people are renting out rooms in their house or even their entire house or their guest house, their apartment, and you, for a fee, you can stay there and you can stay like a local, you can cook in the kitchen, you can take a hot shower, use the Wi-Fi, and, it, and park in the parking lot and save a shit ton of money. And another cool thing is if you're dealing with in, in the room in the local's house, um, you can ask that per whoever's hosting you tips and tricks about the neighborhood. Where is the best food? Where's the cheapest food? Where do you park? What should I do? Like what are the activities that are must see and must do in this neighborhood? I've actually met a lot of friends staying in their Airbnb rooms and I've gotten some really good tips out of staying at Airbnbs. So I totally recommend checking out Airbnb. Use my link down below to save $40 off your first night. Um, but uh, you're staying with a group of people, like a family, you might wanna try VRBO. I've never used VRBO myself. Um, I'll leave a link for VRBO down, down below. But VRBO is Vacation Rentals by Owner. Um, that's what it stands for. And it's usually an entire house or an entire apartment. So 
Um, it's gonna have several rooms and it helps like if you're staying with a whole big family or like a big group of friends. So you, it's like a nice big vacation rental for all of you to use. Also, the first time I traveled across the United States, I didn't even know about Airbnb yet. In 2015, at the beginning of 2015, I did a road trip across the United States. 2015 or was it 2014? I think it was 2015. I didn't even know about Airbnb yet, so I we I experimented with Couchsurfing.com, which is a website where people where locals open up their home for free. I've only used Couchsurfing one time myself, and I didn't really enjoy the experience, but. Perhaps I should give a, another try, make some new friends, I don't know, travel for free. But I much preferred Airbnb because it, almost, it always guaranteed your own room instead of somebody's couch where you can close the door and, you know, have a little bit of privacy. You know, the older you get, the kind of comfort is a little bit more important, you know, Wi-Fi and and then because you're paying them a little bit of money, you don't feel as guilty being like, okay, I don't wanna hang out with you. I, uh, <laughs> I wanna go do my own thing. Though I've had, I've hung out with my Airbnb hosts before and it was all, you know, it's been a blast. It was a lot of fun and it was a great way to experience the local scene. Thing, another way I booked some cheap accommodation during that first trip was if you're road tripping across the USA, if you stop at all the different travel stops and the truck stops and the rest stops and the visitor centers, they usually will have these coupon books, I think. You can also access it from hotelcoupons.com, but they'll have these coupon books. And as we're road tripping along, we're driving, would find the next big city that we're approaching and we'd open up the coupon book and see what coupons we'd find for the approaching city. I used to save those coupon books so just specifically in case I ever made a video like this, but I don't have one with me right now. But anyway, those coupon books often would have rooms for $35 a night, $42 a night, up to $50 a night. And they tend to be cheaper than the hotels that you would find, say, if you saw a rinky-dink like budget in. And sometimes they'll they'll post their prices. They'll say like, today only thirty five dollars a night, one room, one person, blah blah blah. Um, if you go in there, be like, hey, I have thirty dollars. Can you put me up? Sometimes, sometimes they'll take you. Sometimes they won't. You could you could try that, but you know when you do stuff like that, you can expect to stay in some of the worst hotel rooms you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> um, but the hotel coupon books will offer slightly better rooms and then Airbnb will s offer even better rooms like they're very much like a better deal than a hotel a lot of the time <laughs> and then also you can stay in hostels and whenever I stay in hostels <laughs> a lot of people have flashbacks of that scary movie hostel <laughs> It's not that scary, you guys. I've stayed in a bunch of hostels. I've stayed in a hostel in New Orleans before. I've stayed in a hostel in Montreal before. I've stayed in a hostel. Where else have I stayed in a hostel? Hostels are actually a lot of fun. They're, uh, I went during the off season and I stayed in a hostel in New Orleans. And, you know, it was a dorm room with a bunch of bunks, but there was nobody else staying there, so we got an entire room to ourselves, and it was $55 a night. There were, you know, you meet a lot of friends in the hostels because they've got common areas where people hang out, and you can also make money there, say if you're an artist, say I d do henna tattoos, so um, I'd, I'll go ahead and hang out in the common room of the hostels, and I'll do henna tattoos for $5, and I'll make a couple extra bucks that way. Um, my boyfriend draws caricatures. He'll draw caricatures for drinks or for for money, for tips. And yeah, we make a little bit of money along the way doing doing that. So hustle is a lot of fun are a lot of fun too, and they're not scary. I mean, you could go to a bad hostel or a good hostel, just like you can um, go to a bad hotel and a good hotel. So consider hostels as well. 
but my number one favorite way, and it is the play, the way that I book accommodation 90% of the time is airbnb.com. Number eight is gonna be all my road trip tips. I've done quite a few road trips. I've, got, I've driven cross country and internationally several times. And let me go ahead and give you my road trip tips and how to save money on road trips. The cool thing about road trips is that take road trips locally, you can take them internationally. America is built for road trips, you guys. Like the highway systems and how many gas stations there are and the subsidized gas. America is beautiful, it's expansive, it's so multicultural and every major city has its own personality. It's so cool. Like if you've never done a USA road trip before, try to squeeze one in, try, try to plan one because America's built for this, you know. Politically, well, there's some iffy things going on in America, but it still remains one of the best places to go on a road trip, and it is beautiful. And there is friendly, awesome people on the left and the right throughout America, and it's the best way to get to know your country. So um, if you've never traveled for real before, consider traveling in America, and consider traveling uh, and taking a road trip. You may think that you can't do a road trip because your car can't handle it. Well, you can do smaller road trips with, like say, do a trip around the Northeast. So if you live in New England, you could do a tour around New England and say if your car ever broke down, you could call up AAA and they could tow you because you're only 100 miles away. <laughs> um, or you could rent a car and you'd be, you know, all the same websites I talked about earlier, Groupon, Travelocity, Expedia, uh, they also have great deals on renting a car and uh, I rented a car out in Las Vegas uh, when me my friend last March did a a uh, small road trip, one week road trip around the, uh, the southwest where we went to the Grand Canyon and Antelope Canyon, Horseshoe Bend in Las Vegas. I think we only rented that car for, I want to say, $30 a day. It cost me $130 for the trip. Um, so that really wasn't that expensive. If you're really looking to rough it, I have you know, slept in the car, so I didn't have to spend any money on accommodation before. But you know, if you're a little, if you're a person of a certain age, you may not want to do that anymore. That's something that beneficial to be a young traveler to do. Most of these trips are kind of for younger travelers. You know, if you're of a certain age, if you're retired, if you get eggs and pains, you probably want a comfy bed. But also another tip on saving money on road trips. Don't buy a bunch of water bottles. <laughs> Not only is that really bad for the planet, like don't be wasting all that plastic. Uh, anytime you stop at a restaurant like a Subway, you can always, you know, fill up your wa like a reusable water bottle. Just get a BPA-free reusable water bottle and you'd save a bunch of money. You might want to get like a 12-pack of water bottles in case of emergencies, in case you can't you're in the middle of nowhere and you can't get water and you're really thirsty, you know, have some for emergencies, but don't rely on them. Definitely have a reusable water bottle and use it as much as you can. A tip I picked up on road trips for saving gas. First of all, if you're traveling from America and going over the border, if you live in New England, you should definitely plan a trip to Montreal once or twice. Just drive there because uh, I live in the Pioneer Valley in Massachusetts. It's literally a three hour drive, like three or four hour drive up to uh, Montreal. And you get that out of country experience. It's really not a hard drive, like just do it. <laughs> and I don't think you need any special licensing or anything like that to drive your car in Canada. That. But before you go over the border, into Canada, fill up your gas tank on the border in Vermont. <laughs> uh, because something you may not know is in America, gas is subsidized. It's much cheaper than it is basically anywhere else in the world. That's why American road trips are such a thing, such a good deal. Um, and such an amazing experience. That's something you can do for pretty cheap. Um, so make sure you tank up before you cross the border. And also, so a pattern that I've noticed for buying gas in America is you don't want to buy gas in a big city like New York City, and you don't want to buy gas in a super rural country town. <laughs> um, because, you know, in those country towns, there's usually only one gas station every like 50 miles. 
they're gonna have higher prices and in the cities the cost of living drives prices in general so you're gonna pay higher prices the pl best places to tank up when you can large suburban towns and some of the cheapest places cost of living drives those prices so some of the cheapest places I find uh, to get gas is like any town that has a Kmart <laughs> usually will have really cheap gas pr grass prices too and those towns that are kind of built as like truck stop towns um, those those towns will have the cheapest gas prices too. One road trip we took, we had this big book that was called, I think it was called Next Exit. And it was a book of different highways and the different exits and what's, what you can find when you exit off those exits. So it'll be like restaurants, gas stations, hotels, different things. Really handy tool for, um, for road trips actually so if you're planning a big USA road trip it's, uh, you're you're gonna want an atlas and you want you might want to get that big next exit guide because uh, you'll look at this book and you'll see certain exits have a ton of stuff and there's certain exits that have a few things exits that have the ton of stuff like a ton of hotels a ton of gas stations a ton of restaurants um, those will those places will probably usually have cheaper gas prices because all those different gas stations will be competing against each other for the best price. So that will drive the prices down in general. Um, so yeah, those are my tips for road trips. Next tip, this is tip number, I think eight. And this is this is us getting really, really hacky now, getting into the hacks. But um, try to find, if, you're, if you ever are looking for like all-inclusive trips, check out the deals on Groupon.com. I'm actually really tempted right now because I saw a deal on Groupon that was a nine day trip to China with a flight out of Boston with accommodation and a few activities and a few meals in there, nine days for under $500. Unreal, right? I'm actually super, super tempted to go ahead and, and book that because it's like, I've never even seen a flight alone for $500, never mind your flight and your accommodation and a couple activities and a couple meals all for under $500 to China. Like, you know, China isn't even high up on my list of places to go. And it's a tour, it's a couple different cities. It's Beijing and Shanghai and somewhere else too. And the Great Wall of China. Um, so I'm really interested in taking that and Groupon has a ton of other really great deals too. So if you're flexible about where you want to go and you want a really good deal, ch keep checking back on Groupon, see what they got going on. Um, and also, anytime you shop anywhere, plug in the Ebates browser. Ebates is an app. Okay, so before my camera cut out, I think the last thing I was talking about was Ebates. I don't know what Ebates is, it's a either web extension that you attach to your browser on your computer or it's an app on your phone. And it's a cashback app. It's totally free to download and it gives you cashback on all these online purchases you make. You can use it for like a bajillion different things. You can use it for like almost any kind of major retailer you can think of. You can use it, get cashback on, for shopping on eBay, at Sephora. That's what I use it for a lot. Forever 21, see Am sometimes Amazon, Walmart, like all these retailers that you might shop online at all the time. Recently they started doing this thing called Travel Thursday uh, where they do extra deals for like travel that you book through online and they have a bunch of uh, retailers such as, oh yeah, here we go, Amazon's 5% cashback and Sephora's 5% cashback. Say you wanna put in Expedia. Expedia has up to 7% cashback even Royal Caribbean. Let's check that out. Our Cruise Direct Priceline, up to 7% back at cash back on Travelocity, 2% cash back on CheapCaribbean.com. So you can get like just cash back on a bunch of these travel retailers. And I think they do extra, extra deals on Thursdays, travel Thursdays. So check out uh, Ebates as one of the things to save money on. I don't know what number we're on on anymore. Are we number nine, number 10? I don't know. Tip is uh, instead of cabs, try to Uber or Lyft as much as possible. 
Um, I'll leave links down below for U Uber and Lyft. If you live under a rock and you don't know where Uber or Lyft is, it's a ride sharing service. Somebody picks you up in a regular car, but it's usually very nice. It's a usually very nice car. It's usually, I think the rule is that like it can't be more than 10 years old. There's ratings, so uh, there's you can read your driver's reviews. So if your driver's having bad reviews for being creepy, you can cancel your ride. <laughs> I think there's an extra fee for canceling your ride or anything like that, but if you're really uncomfortable, then you're, that's an option to you. It's a really great service because almost always, every driver I've ever driven with has always had like a four or five star rating anyway. They're never bad or anything like that. Oh, and I've also enjoyed a lot of great conversation with Uber and Lyft drivers before. Not every city in the world has Uber and Lyft, and uh, some of them are cracking down on them, actually. Check out the links down below and use Uber and Lyft as much as you can, especially if you're, like, kind of staying a little bit further away from where you'd like to go drink. <laughs> uh, definitely, you know, practice responsible drinking and get a, get a lift out to wherever you're going to be drinking and get a lift back to your hotel room. Um, rather than a cab, which is going to be way more expensive. Also, another thing to add to that is a lot of cities have awesome public transportation. Riding that public transportation could be a lot of fun too, you know. In San, in San Francisco, you can ride the trolleys. In uh, New York, they have super reliable subways. That can be very cheap. Or, you know, a great way to get a lot of really good exercise while traveling is walk as much as you can and you can save a lot of money and you can experience a lot of the city that way too. You can experience a lot of cool little things that you may, have, may not have seen. Now, when I went to Europe last April, um, I look at my health app during that time and I'm like amazed as to how much I walked during that time that I was there. Like, see all how tall the bar graphs are over here? That's how much walking I did in Europe and as soon as I came back from Europe, almost no walking. <laughs> the last tip I'm gonna give, tip number 11 I think we're on now, and it's kind of a much more complicated tip for getting cheap deals and good flights and um, you know mo free money for travel is a thing called travel hacking and I think this is this is a little bit more complicated this deserves its own video in itself but I'm gonna briefly talk about what travel hacking is and and I'll recommend a few cards for you to try out this with if you're if this is something you're interested in so travel hacking is this idea that a lot of travel credit cards um, will offer a sign up bonus package of bonus points that can be redeemed for travel. Usually there's a couple hopes that you have to jump through to get those points. Like say you have to spend $3,000 in three months, which I always do anyway. Like I usually will spend even just living at home, doing regular chores and doing with regular expensive, doing gas and groceries and just any other like things that might pop up, like car repairs and stuff, it usually ends up being around $1,000 a month. So make all your purchases that you possibly can, especially if you're planning on doing bigger purchases. Sign up for one of these travel credit cards, get that bonus point package, and now you've got free money use towards travel and I've done this quite a few times before I've gotten a thousand dollars off of when I was living in LA for two months I got a thousand dollars off of accommodation because I used two different credit cards where I used the bonus points to thousand dollars on accommodation um, and last earlier this year I bought two tickets round trip tickets to Trinidad and Tobago for, and which I basically got for free. And I had a little bit left over to get another flight to Las Vegas later, later in the year. And that I used the bonus points for my American Express card to do that. But you have to be very clever. You have to be very smart. Uh, the reason that these credit card companies offer these bonus point packages is because they are expecting people to be irresponsible with their money and they'll get into debt and then they can profit off of debt. 
you have to play the credit card at their own game and just kind of, you know, get that bonus point package, but always be really good about making your payments on time and try to make them in full as much as you can too. And if you do this correctly, not only will you get a ton of free travel, but you'll also raise your credit score too. So let me just go ahead and talk, mention a few credit cards that I would probably recommend to start you off doing this. The first credit card I would probably recommend is this Discover It Miles card. Uh, this is a really good card for beginners too, or you've never really even had a credit card before. Uh, Discover is a good brand that is good for noob credit card owners. And the bonus package, you know, they don't really have a bonus package per se. But when I signed up for this credit card, you know, they give you 1.5 miles for every dollar you spend. And for every purchase you make in your first year, they'll double your points at the end of the year. So say um, you made $10,000 worth of purchases in the first year of you having this card. 1,500 points normally, but then they'll double, double it. 30,000 points at the end of the year, which will, I think, equal out to $300 towards a trip. And you can use it on anything, anything that, uh, any kind of travel that you apply to this credit card. Any kind of travel that you apply to this credit card, can you can redeem those points for, you can redeem that free money for. So this is a really good one for beginners. I recommend it's Cover It Miles card. And I'll link it down below if you wanna sign up. I'll link everything down below if you want to sign up. Okay, this is another really good one in general. This is, I think a lot of websites actually list this as the best travel credit card, uh, but this is the Chase Sapphire Preferred credit card. I'll leave a link down below if you want to sign up. This is a really good credit card because it has a amazing bonus points offer. I think if you, I might be wrong about this, but I'll, explain down below, I'll correct myself down below if, if I am wrong, but I believe if you spend $5,000 in your first three months, you get 50,000 bonus miles, which is worth up to $600 in free travel credit. So that is amazing. It does have an annual fee. Um, I think the annual fee, it's waived the first year. After that, I think it's like $100 a year, which I think is worth it because it also offers um, travel insurance. So say you needed to like cancel your trip that you booked on this card, they can offer you a little bit of money for that. And if anything bad happens, say like, <laughs> I cover up the chip on this card whenever I'm showing it on camera because I just am paranoid that you can like scan the information from it through the camera or whatever. But there are people out there that have like these machines that can scan the information from your credit card and steal your information and put a bunch of charges on your credit card. If Chase identifies that as a fraudulent purchase, you will not be held uh, accountable for that purchase. So you are protected in that way. You're protected from a lot of bad things that can happen while you're traveling when you have this. So this is actually, you know, a lot of these travel hacking cards I cancel before the annual fee comes around, but this one I keep around because of that travel insurance. This is one of the cards I used to get $1,000 of free accommodation when I was living in Los Angeles. So that was very helpful to have. Link down below if you wanna sign up for that one. Very much recommend this one. And on top of the bonus points that you get, you also get, I believe, two points for every dollar that you spend on travel and dining, and then one point for everything else that you spend it on. You'll not only get that bonus point package, but then you'll be also racking up points on top of that, so you'll get a lot of free money that way. Next put card I wanna talk about briefly is the Capital One Venture card. It's a really great card because it also has that insurance, like the Sapphire Preferred card, and it has a great bonus point package. I believe it's like, 40,000 bonus points after you spend 3,000 the first three months. <laughs> I'll, I'll have actual data down below. Um, but on top of that, you get two points for every dollar you spend on anything. It doesn't have to be travel and dining. It can be anything. You get two bonus points for anything that you spend it on 
and I think the annual fee is pretty low. I think it's only like $50 a month or a year. And then you get that travel insurance. So that this is a really good card too. If you can't get the Sapphire Preferred, which I actually couldn't get the first couple times I signed up for it. They like told me I didn't make enough or whatever. This one's a good one too. And the last one I want to mention is just this American Express Business Plus card. This is the one I'm using, working towards getting now. I actually had the American Express Gold Business Plus card, and that is the card that I use to get my free flights to Trinidad and Tobago. But then I canceled it because it does have a really high, <laughs> high annual fee, and before the annual fee came up, I went to cancel it, and they actually told me that I could uh, exchange it for this one. Um, and I could, and I'm getting my bonus points and I got my I only had a few points left over from that old card, but I was able to put it on this one and then I'm going to get a bonus point package from this card as well. I believe this one does not have an annual fee, but the other one, the, the gold Bus business plus card had an annual fee, but it had, it had really awesome perks. Like this one, I think you get a point for every dollar you spend and then you get that bonus point package. Uh, but the other card, the Gold Business Plus card, it was like you could pick one category to get three bonus points, point, points for, and then there was four other categories where you got two bonus points for, and then um, anything that wasn't one of those categories uh, was one bonus point for getting it. So um, I picked gas as my bonus points that where you get three bonus points per dollar. You know, I was getting a lot of points every time I bought gas. Uh, so that was a really good card too. And link down below if you wanna sign up for the that card. So that is it guys. Uh, sorry if this video was really, really rambly, but as you can see, there was a lot of information. There's a lot of tips and tricks that I had to share with you. Like I say, this is an art form. <laughs> this is a skill. Finding cheap travel, good travel, how to ch travel often and travel for a while. I'm happy to share my skills with you. I left a lot of links down below for different ways you can get free money, get cheap hotels, get the cheapest hotels, and you gotta kind of put a in quite a bit of time too, you know? Time is money. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Let, let me know down in the comments below if you're gonna use any of these tips and tell me about your next trip that you're planning. And if you're gonna use any of those tips, how are you gonna use them? <laughs> I love hearing about people's travel plans all the time and that is how I pick up more tips too when people tell me about their travel plans that's how I learn about how to get even more cheap deals so and thanks for watching this video I hope you liked it I hope you learned something and I will uh, see you next time I hope to actually in my next video video do go a little bit more in depth onto travel hacking and what are good credit cards that I've used before and what you should use uh, but you got a little crash course in this video too Thanks again for joining me in this video, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye. <laughs>